I'm Park Howell, and welcome to the Business of Story, where I consult, teach, coach, and speak on the applied science and bewitchery of brand and business storytelling, so that you can clarify your story to amplify your impact and simplify your life. I thought it was just a stupid picture of a pig in the ocean. But after hearing that story, I had to have it. Now I wasn't just buying a picture. I was buying a story. Story literally made the picture worth more money to me. That's what businesses are about. People buy brands. People buy stories much more than anything else. I work with a lot of big enterprise companies, but let's just say I always tell folks, drop the PowerPoint, close your laptops, start with your story. If you want people to get engaged and you want people to act, you have to tell them an emotionally powerful story. That's with great characters, it's with uncertain outcomes, and it's with high stakes and drama. All business strategy is a story. A few months ago, we aired one of our more controversial episodes of The Business of Story. It featured defense attorney Doug Passan and how he uses storytelling to help his convicted felons get leaner sentences. Now, it was controversial because many listeners reached out saying that convicts don't deserve a break and that Doug's use of storytelling was just to manipulate the judges and the system. Uh, I totally understand that reaction. I mean, after all, we are binary creatures constantly seeking out right from wrong, black from white, hot from cold, yes and no. But in doing so, we miss the nuance of a situation, of a person's background that can explain but not make excuses for their dirty deed. If you want to hear his show after listening to today's guest, who Doug introduced me to, by the way, it's show number 182 titled, How Defense Attorneys Use Cinematic Storytelling to Reduce Sentences. See what you think. But today's guest, don't go anywhere because she is fabulous. She is an award-winning writer, director, actor, and story consultant who works at the intersection of the Arts for Social Change. More specifically, storytelling to transform pro-social action. Jessica Blank has a deep background in theater, film, and television as both creator and performer. And she teaches story structure at the Juilliard School and NYU's graduate film program. Pretty impressive stuff. Jessica has spent the last two decades studying, understanding, and activating how the arts can connect inspire and motivate pro-social change. She got her start when what seemed like a whim at first, she and her soon-to-be husband wrote and produced the docuplay called The Exonerated. The Exonerated brought attention to prisoners sitting on death row who had been wrongly accused and wrongly convicted. Their docuplay and their storytelling abilities brought people together around this very, very controversial subject and they literally saved lives as sentences were commuted because of their work. Since then, Jessica, with her storytelling, has been exploring how to unite disparate worlds far apart on social causes for greater understanding, greater empathy, and rightful action. Her central question is always, how do I make them care? On today's show, you'll learn how storytelling is simply a technology for triggering empathy and how to use it to do just that. How you can move people and take them on a journey to get them engaged in a respectful and intelligent dialogue around a social issue. And how to increase your story literacy to help you become a more influential change maker. So let's dive in into this edition of The Business of Story with Jessica Blank. Jessica, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. And thank you for taking time out of your schedule. You are hanging out in Venice, California, what, on vacation, work? What are you it's doing? Sort of, it's sort of a working vacation. I have a bunch of meetings out here, and we have very dear friends who live out here. So we thought we would combine it all and come out into the 75-degree weather for a week and a half, escape the heat wave of New York. 
Well, I appreciate you taking the time to be here with us. You and I got a chance to get acquainted on a call about a month ago, and I was really fascinated by your work in the arts and storytelling and that intersection of social purpose, you know, cause of how we can use storytelling and the arts in general to help promote positive social change interaction, cultures, and so forth. And so I'm really looking forward to exploring this with you today because in looking at your bio, story and acting, writing has had a transformative change in your life. And can you take us to a moment as a young person that in hindsight, looking back at it, it was a moment that has sort of informed and shaped who you are today in what you teach? <laughs> like when I was a kid, you mean, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Way back uh, when. Well, then I have to decide how embarrassing I want to go. I'll go as <laughs> okay, most you know embarrassing as possible. Right. Okay. So I will, I'll describe, I'll tell you a story that I think describes exactly who I was as a kid and weirdly who I am as a grown up too. So Perfect. in sixth grade, we hadn't started reading Shakespeare in school yet, but I grew up in Washington, D.C. and my there was there are wonderful Shakespeare theaters there. The main theater there at the time was called the Folger. And my parents took me to the theater. And they took me to see a production of Romeo and Juliet there that blew my mind. It was a really extraordinary production. The the actors were wonderful. And it just like it was the first moment I had where I, I felt fully transported by the theater. And it was, you know, it's a high level Shakespeare production. So on a sort of technical and craft level, you don't get much better than that. And so I became slightly Shakespeare obsessed as a young sixth grader. You can imagine I was like really cool. Uh, <laughs> and I decided I was going to translate Romeo and Juliet into contemporary slang, cast my classmates, direct a production of it, and cast myself as Juliet. And the boy I had a crush on as Romeo, of course. Well, that sounds like a perfect plan. Of course. I went to a great progressive school and I had a really encouraging teacher who was very supportive of these aims. And I spent, it must have been a month's worth of recesses indoors, translating, creating my like, you know, slang, teen slang version of Romeo and Juliet script. And then I cast my, I did cast my classmates. We probably rehearsed it for a few recesses. And then at lunchtime one day, we did a performance of it. But remember that nobody in my sixth grade class had read Romeo and Juliet or knew anything about Shakespeare. So my poor classmates had, who were in the audience, had absolutely no idea whatsoever what was going on except the vice principal had come to watch and he was sitting in the back of the classroom, like guffawing. He was like the, literally the most supportive audience member I've ever had in my entire life, <laughs> like, trying to make up for the entire classroom. And it's kind of funny because, you know, that's who I was as a kid. And that's kind of, <laughs> it, it kind of lines up with what my career is today, right? Like I, I write, I adapt from pre-existing material right? I direct my own work. I am writing partners with my husband. So, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of funny how it all lines up. It's like a sixth grade time capsule. It is. It is. Jessica Blank time capsule. You go and open that up and you see every aspect of what you do today. Yes. And now I've lost like any coolness points I might've started out with. Oh, <laughs> you're that nerd as a kid. I was like an art nerd. Yeah, that cracks me up. I was just a little bit older, but I was thinking, what was my, you know, Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet inspiration as a young man? And I got to tell you, it wasn't that, but it was George Cohen's Yankee Doodle Dandy starring David Cassidy. And for those of you who don't know who David Cassidy is, just watch The Partridge Family. And we were sitting right down in the front row because my dad had a hard time hearing and my mom and dad took me and my two younger brothers to Yankee Doodle Dandy at the Seattle Opera House. And uh, it was amazing. It blew me away. And because of that, I knew music, storytelling, production somehow was going to be a part of my life. So it's not quite Shakespeare, but it was a lot of fun, I got to tell you. I bet. So now, did that propel you then into studying theater and acting in school? Or where did, where, where did that take you? Yeah. So 
I mean, from sixth grade, I continued on to seventh grade. <laughs> and, uh, and, congratulations. And actually, <laughs> thanks. But I did actually start doing theater as an actor in seventh grade. And the first play I was in was actually a Shakespeare play. And I was all throughout high school, I was a theater nerd, but also a writer and also into academics, or at least the academics that I was interested in. I never did great in math, but I was, I was really into English class. And then I, I went to college and I, I wound up designing my own major. I did an interdisciplinary major where I was basically studying acting and writing. And then I was doing critical theory and cultural studies on what it means to do those things. And where'd you go to school? I went to McAllister in the University of Minnesota. Mm, okay. I love the Twin Cities. I just have to give a little shout out to the Twin Cities. They're a great place. I was very sad to leave them and go to New York, even though I was happy to go to New York. And then, so then I went to New York <laughs> and went to acting school. And so I, you know, I was always writing. That was back in the days when, you know, the conventional wisdom was you had to pick a thing and do one thing for a career, especially if you were working in the arts or else you weren't serious. And back in the days, you mean like the 1990s? <laughs> you were the early 21st century. But yes. Oh, way, way back when the early yes. 20, the aughts is but, what you know, you're talking about. Okay. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's, it was a funny shift. Like they really, I caught the very tail end of sort of the 20th century model of how you have a career. Mm -hmm. And I never fit into that. I've always been a hyphenate. I've always been a multidisciplinary person, right? And my parents actually are both multidisciplinary thinkers. And so all throughout my academic career, I was always sort of trying to fit in a, in a box that I didn't quite fit in. Like I, I was an actor. I was very serious about that, but I was also a writer, right? I was a writer. I was very serious about that, but I was also politically engaged, right? And cared about activism and also a thinker, right? And so to me at first when i was first starting out and the model was you have to pick one thing and focus on it if you're really serious i always felt like i was maybe not enough of any one thing or what if this is too many things and it dissipates my focus and then you know i eventually just accepted that i am who i am and i'm the creator that i am and luckily the way work operates now in the 21st century wound up aligning with how i naturally think yeah. So you've got a number of different interests going on. Did you ever have a time when that lack of focus bit you, maybe as an actress or a, or a, a writer, that people said, no, you weren't focused enough? I have to say, not really. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I am. But the, the reason why is because I'm, I'm a very, very hard worker, right? So I, I've always been really dedicated to being very rigorous in everything I do. So there's never been a lack of focus or a lack of rigor. Sometimes what there is is overwork. Yeah. Right. So sometimes you got to find that balance too many things for too mm -hmm. many hours in the day. Mm -hmm. So what then transformed your career? Well, I would say this sort of the origin story of the work that I do now uh, happened not too long after I moved to New York to go to acting school, actually. And I was, so I had just graduated college and I had 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 a little moment about figuring out what path I was going to take. And I, I knew I wanted to come to New York and study acting. I knew that that was actually what I was supposed to do. And at the same time, being a very socially engaged person, being a very politically engaged person, being somebody who was really already at that age felt a very strong drive and sense of responsibility to make the world a better place or help make the world the better version of itself. The more and were there just particular issues that really attracted your attention and energy? I mean, I've so I've always been a holistic and a systems thinker. So to me, in a certain way, all of the quote unquote issues that I care about are all part of the same issues, right? Like we live in an, I believe that we live in an unsustainable system and I'm interested in the sort of philosophical underpinnings of all of that and how we could create a more just and sustainable system across the board. And so I think, you know, any struggles that you look at to make the world a more just 
place are part of that, right? Whether those are envi- that's environmental work or whether that's, I mean, at the time I was really looking at the criminal justice system and the deep, deep flaws in the criminal justice system. And that was something that was really important to me then and still is. But I think, you know, it shows up everywhere and there are a million ways to work for justice. And I felt a drive to do that. I, I felt a sense of moral responsibility. And I couldn't at the time quite square that with the fact that I wanted to be an actor, <laughs> right? I was like, I feel internally that these things are connected somehow, but I couldn't at that time tell you how they were connected, right? Or how that could work, right? So I sort of felt, I felt guilty and torn that I wasn't off doing community organizing or even relief work somewhere, right? Like really helping in a very tangible, clear way. But I also knew that my heart wanted to be in New York and go to acting school. So and you were so, doing, you were kind of following two parallel interests. They hadn't really intersected quite yet, yeah, that I of was, acting and then the other of social change. Yes. And I think, you know, again, I was in the model of where you have to do one thing, right? So I was like, okay, well, I'm sort of sacrificing this. Maybe I'm sacrificing this other thing by focusing on acting. But somewhere in me, I was also like, maybe it is actually possible to create art that can create social change, right? Maybe it is possible to change things and create a more just world using the instrument of art. Then what happened? When did this come together for you? Well, I, I mean, I had that idea as like a young, naive kid in the city. And I was like, you know, maybe this is true or maybe I'm just fooling myself, right? But I'm gonna go to drama school with the idea in the back of my head that maybe I can figure out how to do this, right? So then I was going to, I was going to acting school and I met a guy <laughs> and he was cute and he had been in the city working as an actor for 10 years and I invited him on a date to a death penalty conference. How romantic. University. Yes. He likes to say that it was in the early days of our relationship when he would still say yes to anything I asked him to do. <laughs> <laughs> We've been together 18 years. And you were testing his metal a little bit. Uh, really, yeah, really. I, okay. A little, yeah. I wanted to see if he could hang, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and we were at a workshop at that conference on a group of cases called the Death Row 10, which were all guys who had their confessions tortured out of them by a particular police commander named John Burge, who was found to have done that and fired. He has since been prosecuted and then passed away. But at that point, he had just been disciplined and fired for doing this. These guys, though, were still sitting in prison, some of them on death row. And many of them had no other evidence against them besides these quote unquote confessions, right? So there was a real miscarriage of justice going on. So, you know, we heard a lecture about the cases and we saw some sort of 60 minutes style documentary footage. And it was all very disturbing, but really on an intellectual level. But then the organizers had set up a phone call from one of the guys in prison. And they hooked the cell phone up to his speaker so that for a few minutes he was actually talking to us in the room, telling us his story. That call only lasted a few minutes. There was no earth-shattering information we received in it. But by the time that call was cut off, everyone in the room was in tears. And Eric, the cute guy I brought with me to the conference, um, sort of looked around the room. He was also in tears. But he looked around the room and he was like, yeah, but these aren't the people that need to be having this experience. We're here at a death penalty conference. Everyone who's here is here because they're already invested in this subject and they already know, right? They don't need to be having this big emotional experience about it. And we started writing notes actually back and forth to each other in the back of the classroom, quite literally about how do you get around the problem of preaching to the choir? And how could we bring an experience like the one that we had just had to people who wouldn't think they would be interested in the issue, people who would never show up at a death penalty conference, who were maybe pro-death penalty, who thought the criminal justice system worked just fine, and that if you got caught up in it, you must have done something wrong, and you know, thought about people who had interfaced with some of the problems in the criminal justice system as sort of not different from them, not like them, right? How do you move those people? How do you give them the very real, very deep, very human experience that we had had in that room? And 
he he was an actor also, and we were both interested in the medium of documentary theater, which at that point, um, Anna Devere Smith, Emily Mann and Anna Devere Smith were kind of the godmothers of the genre. Moises Kaufman and Tectonic Theater Project were at that time still at work on Laramie Project, but we, we knew about it. It was sort of in formation in New York. And we had the idea in that conversation to make a documentary play that travel around the country and interview death row exonerees. So people who had been wrongly convicted, sent to death row, and then later freed by the court system amidst overwhelming evidence of their innocence. And to make a play from, from the interview transcripts. So we didn't know how to do that. So you, <laughs> we just, were a couple- you just went into this because it was interesting to you at first. And then you were so moved by this telephone call from this death row inmate who I presume was exonerated at some point later on down the road. I believe so. Yes, there were a number of those cases and I we haven't been able to actually track down which one of the guys was on the call. Oh, uh, OK. Uh, because, you know, we didn't know we were doing something at that moment that was going to become a pivotal thing in our lives. So we would have kept track of everything, but we thought it was, you know, just another Sunday. But isn't that incredible? So the universe just kind of puts you at now this intersection of art and and social change. And so, okay. So you decided after swapping notes in the back Mm -hmm. of the room that you're going to write a documentary play. Yes. And so, and so we had no idea how to do that. Like we were a couple of kids. Neither one of us had ever undertaken anything like this before. And one other question for you, Jessica, mm-hmm. it just occurred to me before you get into how you did it. The motivation behind doing that was to get people who would otherwise not care or have already jumped to their conclusion. If you've been found guilty and you're on death row, then you are you know, probably guilty. And so why even bother with you? Uh, but certainly DNA testing has changed all of that since then. So was it that purely that motivation that how do we get people to take a closer look so we're not accidentally putting the, you know, to death the wrong person? Well, I would say that, you know, in that conversation, it wasn't, we didn't have an, like an explicit policy aim, right? Like both of us were artists. So okay. the way that we thought about, I think the question that you're asking is, how do we bring this emotional experience to people who wouldn't think they'd be interested in it, right? Like, so we already were thinking in terms of what our job is as artists, which is to move people and to take them on a journey, right? So, but we knew that the people that we wanted to take on that journey were people who might not agree with us ideologically, Mm -hmm. right? So we didn't have a like, let's write a play in order to abolish the death penalty, it wasn't exactly that explicit. It was, it, it was more about as human beings, we're engaged in a conversation with each other about what it means to live in a moral universe and what is right and what is wrong. And, and we want to have dialogue with people who might think differently or come into that conversation with a different set of assumptions than we do. Okay. Right. And, and, but, but have that conversation on a really deep human level that involves our emotions, right? And our whole selves rather than just sort of like the kind of ideological arguments that Mm -hmm. we can get into and get stuck in forever, right? So that was the impetus then. That was the impetus. So we, we went home and we started doing research. And like I said, we had no idea what we were doing at the beginning. And so we sort of just winged it and figured it out. And we reached out in the early stages, we reached out to an organization called the Center on Wrongful Convictions. And then a little bit later, we reached out to and we connected with the Innocence Project. Because the first step we knew was we had to find the people, right? There were not that many death row exonerees in the country, and we needed to find out which ones would be interested in talking to us and get in touch with them. So we worked with some, the organizations vetted us, because like I said, we were a couple of kids. They called them up and said, oh, we want to write a play. So, you know, they sort of made sure that we were okay and, and wound up putting us in touch with people. And we spent that summer traveling around the country, we interviewed uh, about 40 exonerees on the phone and then traveled to meet about 20 of them in person. And, you know, that summer changed our lives. We would drive, you know, 10 hours off the nearest interstate to a part of America we had never been in and go in and sit down with somebody for four hours and have our minds completely blown by the stories they were telling us. And come out sort of floored and transformed and get back in the car and start driving <laughs> to another part of the United States to do the same thing again. Right? And what year was this? This was uh, summer of 2000. 
Summer of 2000, and the stories you were hearing, would these death row inmates tell you everything from their upbringing to how they got themselves into trouble and how they found themselves there? I mean, did you get the whole picture? Yes, and we, I mean, that was really something that, I think we did it intuitively and now we're really glad we did. Like we, we did not, I mean, I think, you know, we were talking to folks whose experience with interviews that they had done in the past was that all the people wanted to know about was their legal case. Right. And the, the, the details of the crime that they had been wrongly accused of and how they got out. Right. And we obviously were asking people about, that, but we wanted to know also who they were as human beings, right? I mean, that's, you know, again, we're thinking like dramatists, we are, we make theater, we're artists. So we're interested in who the whole person in front of us is. And that part of their experience is a crucial part of their experience, but it's not the sum total of who they are. And so, you know, the, those interviews went, a lot of them went very deep. And then we, you know, we almost ran out of money five times we kept going as if the money would show up to, you know, because we, you know, we literally had like $400 in our bank account. We lived in a 400 square foot rent stabilized apartment in the East village. We were like a couple of broke young artists, right. Doing this whole thing on a shoestring and just figuring it out as we went along and asking every single person we knew for help. We asked journalist friends how to do an interview. We asked nonprofit friends how to raise money we asked playwright friends how to write a play. We came back and we transcribed all of those interviews and we started writing by, again, doing what we knew how to do, which was get a bunch of actors in a room and have them read the transcripts out loud. And so we figured out a methodology, which we've then replicated about, uh, by, we edited the transcripts by ear. Fast forward, we had a theater that fall that had offered us uh, three nights in it to do some readings of the play and Eric asked a director, Bob Balaban, who he had worked with, if he would direct those readings. And Bob said, well, let me see what you have. And we sent him what we had, which at that point was, you know, 150 pages of raw transcripts, basically. It was not a play yet, but, but he knew us and he knew that we were serious. And he called us back and he said, yes, I will direct this. And do you mind if I show this some, to some friends? We said, no, of course not. Go ahead and show it to whoever you want. And he called us back two weeks later. And he said, Susan Sarandon and Tim Robbins are doing the first reading. (laughs) (laughs) So then we're like, okay, well now we better write something good. Um, I didn't quite understand. I was very young then. And I didn't quite understand what Susan and Tim did by getting on board at that stage. I didn't understand sort of how it works with people who are that well known that they are bombarded constantly with requests to participate in everybody's everything. Right. Mm -hmm. And, we did, they knew Bob well and they trusted him. We did not have a script. We were not known playwrights in any way. Like they really took a gamble on us because they cared about the issue. And their participation opened the door for all kinds of other artists of their caliber to check out the material and look at coming on board too. So we did those first three readings. We had a cast that included Susan and Tim and Richard Dreyfuss and Ossie Davis. It's just like extraordinary actors. Were and you just sitting there blown away? Yeah, like totally like blown pinching away. yourself? Um, totally sixth blown grade away. Jessica is saying, hey, this stuff actually works, pulling yeah, the cast well, and crew together? Yeah, I mean, at that point, it was uh, those readings, it was just exciting that it was a play and that it was going to have a life. And then we went back and we reworked the play pretty we did some serious rewrites on it we went back into all of the court transcripts and case files and added material having to do with that and you know the play had another year and a half on its journey to full production it opened in new york it wound up running for a couple of years it was made into a movie it was had a toured nationally went to london had a whole big life surprising nobody more than us but I think the really the most important moment in the play's life was after it had been running off Broadway for a couple of months. Governor George Ryan of Illinois, who had been a pro-death penalty Republican, who had gotten very concerned about the rate of wrongful convictions in his state. Under his watch, he had seen more people get exonerated from Illinois death row than executed. And he said, okay, there's, there's a problem here, right? He was philosophically in support of the death penalty, but in terms of how it was actually being implemented, he could tell as governor that there was a problem. And he had declared a moratorium on executions actually before we started writing the play so that he could study 
the problem. And he appointed a bipartisan blue ribbon commission to study the problem. And they came back with something like 89 recommendations of things that could be done to substantially lower the risk of wrongful convictions. And the state legislature had enacted exactly one of them during Ryan's time in office. And he was at this point about to leave office. And both of the candidates running to replace him had said they were going to start executions up again. So he was in a situation where he had this deep knowledge of how profound the problem was, a bunch of solutions sitting in front of him that actually could have been implemented to help, not to get rid of the problem, because you can never get rid of the risk of wrongful conviction because humans make mistakes, but could have substantially improved it. And, and no action had been taken. So he started publicly considering commuting the sentences of everyone on Illinois death row to life in prison. Okay, and now real I, quick, Jessica, timeline right here. So mm-hmm. you, were, you started writing this in the summer of 2000. Where are we now? I want to say, and the years blur, I want to say that this was 2003. Mm-hmm. It's possible that it was 2002. <laughs> okay, no, but but I mean, um, the point being, it was not a very long time. Not a lot of time no. passed between the the inception of this whole crazy no, idea to the impact you're having. Not at all. And so mm-hmm. and so we brought the play on a Monday night from New York for a command performance for Governor Ryan and a lot of members of the Illinois State Legislature, 50 death row exonerees, and the play was performed for him and he stayed late into the night listening to the exonerees who were in the audience having conversations. And he did wind up commuting those sentences. He cleared Illinois' death row before he left office. And he has said publicly that the play was a factor in his decision. So that was my answer, right? Like the question that I started out with unresolved at the beginning of the story of like, is it possible to actually use art to make change or is that just a Pollyanna pipe dream or an excuse I'm telling myself because I want to go to acting school, (laughs) but I, you know, right. Or can you really do it? And that journey showed me that it is actually possible. I mean, you don't, that's 167 people were on Illinois death row. It does not get more tangible and concrete than that. Right. So that was a big yes. Yes, it is possible to do this. So I've basically since then, devoted the rest of my working life to figuring out how we did that, how to make it repeatable, and how to teach it to others. So Eric and I now are married, 18 years, writing partners. (laughs) We have a kid. We've been continuing to make work. We continue to make documentary theater. We've made other plays. And our next documentary play opens at the Public Theater in... um, February of 2020. It's called Coal Country. It's based on interviews we did with survivors and surviving family members of the Upper Big Branch mine disaster in West Virginia in 2010. It has original music by the country musician Steve Earle. So that's, you know, so we continue to, and we've made, we've made movies and we write for television. So we continue to make work as storytellers. And I train storytellers. I teach in the graduate drama program at Juilliard and the graduate film school at NYU. And I coach artists privately. But, you know, I've been working as an artist at this intersection of story and social change for almost two decades now. And at a certain point, it dawned on me, oh, these tools actually are not just for artists, right? I know how to teach people how to use them to write a screenplay or make a play or write a book, right? or write a solo show. But actually, you know, sometimes when I'm doing that, I'm working with people who have never written before, right? It's not that I'm only working with like Hollywood screenwriters or playwrights that are already being produced off Broadway or whatever. And I see how the structures and the methodologies that I'm teaching people are things that anybody at any experience level can absorb. And I know what story can do in terms of how it can impact people emotionally and actually change their worldviews. I mean, one of the great things about being a playwright is that nobody knows what you look like. So you can sit in the audience after your own play and hear what people really think. And really experience it. So to put a bow on your play, it was called The Exonerated. Did it go on to become a TV show, movie, or anything made for TV? Yeah, it was. Yes, it was. 
we made it into a movie for Core TV, which is a fairly faithful version of the play, actually, um, and has extraordinary actors in it. Susan Sarandon is in it, Danny Glover, Delroy Lindo, and I think it's out there on iTunes. So that was, you know, in 2005, and we wrote a book about it called Living Justice, and which I think was also published that same year. And you know, the play still gets produced. It it had its life. You know, its life was about you know, 2000 to 2005 in is sort of its main life. It's New York, it's New York life, the tour of that production. We went to London, et cetera, et cetera. But since then, you know, what happens with plays is that they get, they can be licensed, right? So people can produce them anywhere. And it's an amazing thing. It gets produced a lot at theaters all over the world. Actually, it was just done in Tehran, which is extraordinary. It's been translated into Mandarin and done in China, which is kind of incredible to me. But it also gets done a lot at schools. Mm -hmm. which is really gratifying to Eric and for Eric and I, because I think, you know, it's, it's an, we've seen some of the, you know, sometimes the university will bring us to keynote or give a master class mm -hmm. or whatever in conjunction with a production that they're doing. And it is really amazing to see kids at a young age engaging deeply on a human level with the play, because I think it just, it makes, you know, it does the work that we were intending to do at a really deep level because it just, makes people think about how the and talk about how the criminal justice system actually works um, at a time when their ideas about the world are still forming. Yeah. So Jessica, there are a ton of people, listeners out there that have purpose-driven brands that are trying to make the impact that you, know, you made, but in different ways. They make it through their people and their organization. They make it through their advertising and marketing a lot of mm -hmm. times, so, you know, depending on you know, what stories they're telling and what they stand for. But, you know, they are not trained artists. They don't teach at Juilliards. They don't have, you know, access to Tim Robbins. And so I, I think a lot of people go, well, that's nice, but how do I do that? Mm -hmm. So can you, can you share with us some of the points that you share with your clients, you know, who don't strictly come from the arts world, the storytelling world, they come from finance, they come from business, sure. they know they want their business to have a greater purpose than just selling something. So where do they start? How does, let me ask you this, maybe more pointed. How does story in your experience actually work to help create this transformation? Yeah, right. Well, because I think that's, that's a great question to start with, because I think, you know, story now, unlike six or eight years ago, story is a really hot word, right? Like it's, you hear it everywhere, right? Everybody's talking about the power of story and what's the story of your company and what's the story of your organization. But few people actually teach how to do it. How That's to do the big it. Thing. Exactly. Yeah. So everybody's out here saying like, I know story is important. I can feel that it's important. I'm aware that it's powerful. What am I supposed to do with that information? Right? right. Yep. And the way that I teach story is I think different from how the word is often used in like sort of marketing, messaging, communications circles, the insights in term, like into how story works and what I mean when I use the word story are the ones that are coming from the arts, right? So I think what's exciting too is that neuroscience is actually starting to catch up with understandings about story and story structure that artists have understood intuitively for centuries. And actually not only artists, but audiences, right? Like as human beings, we are wired for story, right? We're wired to tell stories. We're wired to listen to stories. And we all can kind of actually feel when we're caught up in an interesting story and an exciting story, right? When we're, when we're hearing or seeing a story or listening to somebody who's a great storyteller. Like we, we know that that's what's happening and we can feel the effect that it has on us. But I think because there's not sort of widespread literacy outside the arts around what story really is and how it works, we get caught up in thinking that, oh, we're having this amazing experience of this story right now, this powerful experience of hearing or seeing a story because the person telling it or creating it is so talented or is so charismatic, right? Or is innately such a great storyteller. We like, it, there's this like sort of, we mystify it, right? Because it's the sort of magical thing that we're like, oh, we know what that thing is, but we don't imagine that we could do it because it seems like it's just happening by magic because the person is good at it. And, you know, one of my, <laughs> one of my little mini missions as somebody who's coming from the arts and entertainment, but also, I, you know, I work extensively in the nonprofit and advocacy fields 
So it is, is sort of getting rid of the concept of talent. I, I don't like the concept of talent. I think it, it mystifies a process that is actually a concrete process that anybody can learn, right? It's like a set of tools, right? So just as music, in music, you have music theory, right? And there are sort of like underlying patterns. There are mathematical pre-existing patterns that anybody who's composing music is learning or playing music is learning how to work with, right? Or as in visual art, you have compositional geometry, you have color theory, right? Like there are underlying patterns that just exist in the world, right? I think the same is true with story. There is an underlying story structure, right? And it tracks with Aristotle's poetics, it tracks with Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, it tracks with Freytag's pyramid, that triangle we all watched the teachers draw on the mm -hmm. blackboard in English class, right? And they're I all mean, kind of talking about the same thing, aren't they're they? They're all you talking know? about the same thing, and yep. actually now they align with what neuroscience understands about what, what happens in our brain when we hear stories told in a certain structure, in that structure. It does a specific concrete thing to our brain. So you know, a lot of the work that I do is about teaching people what that structure is and how it works and then how to use it strategically because you don't have to be Shakespeare, right? You don't have to even be a playwright, right? You don't have to be a screenwriter. You don't have to be working in you the can, arts. You can be a chief it. marketing officer. You could be a director of sustainability. You can be a CFO. That's right. You can be a janitor. It That's literally, right. because we are storytelling animals, if you've read Jonathan Gottschall's wonderful book I love it. I on love the it. fact that you're exactly right. Now, talent may get you to Shakespeare's level after a whole ton of hard work, but we don't need to be at that level to make change, social change and make transformative change through the messages that we share through these story structures, right? Yes, absolutely, because it's actually the structure itself that's genius. It's the structure itself that has the effect on our brains, right? So it's not that we have to be individual artists with some epic vision in order to have that kind of impact on the audience. We actually just need to understand how to work with this structure because it's our response to it is wired into us. Like yeah. stories affect us emotionally. They make us walk in the main character's shoes. Like that's an automatic process, right? Once we can hook into a character, we automatically empathize and we automatically go on their journey. So if that journey is well-structured in a basic way, we will go on the ride. Story is a technology for triggering empathy. That's how I like to talk about it, right? And it really- oh, it really, I like that. Technology right? for triggering empathy. Yeah. And that empathic response happens automatically. Our brains are actually wired for it, right? So you don't have to be a great artist to make somebody- empathize with a character we our brains already want to empathize with a character we just have to give the audience someone to get on the ride with so in the structures that you're talking about do you boil them down i mean the the hero's journey can get pretty complex yes um you know 17 steps i've boiled it down to 10 <laughs> steps that i use for business and even that is really hard unless you have a lot of time with an audience to really get them to understand that Quickly, do you have a structure that people could take away right now that like, oh, I can start thinking about that as they formulate their messaging? Yes. I mean, so I think the, the, there's a neuroscientist who I really love named Paul Zak, and he did a series of experiments measuring how story could motivate people towards pro-social action. By the way, I had Paul Zak on the show. He was oh. one of my very first guests here on Business of Story. Four years ago, I think he's show number five. Oh, that's amazing. I'll have to go back and listen to it. I have never met him and I talk about him all the time. I'm like a Paul Zak fan girl. Because, <laughs> because he's, a, he's a great guy, by the way. That's great. This experiment that he ran is so amazing to me because it confirms so many things that are really could use confirming. So he he looked at how different story structures could motivate people towards pro-social action. And he designed a series of short films around the same subject, childhood cancer, with the same characters, but structured differently. And like they were like three minute films or something. And he hooked the audience members up to measure their levels of oxytocin and ACTH, which is a stress hormone that's a precursor to cortisol, as they were watching these films and looked at their their response to the films and then whether they donated money to an organization 
working to help cure childhood cancer at the end, right? So he was looking at the correlations of all of these different variables. And what he found was the story structures that just spiked oxytocin, right, which is empathy, yeah, didn't cause people to give money. The story structures that just spiked ACTH, which is a stress hormone, right, which is narrative tension, didn't cause people to give money. The story structures that motivated people towards pro-social action were the ones that spiked blood levels of both oxytocin and ACTH. So that's empathy and narrative tension. Or if you want to nerd out and go back to high school English class and Aristotle's poetics, that's pity and fear. I always wondered what he meant by those words, and now I finally <laughs> understand, right? So I talk of or, or character and plot, right? So I talk about those as like the two primary things that you're dealing with when you're talking about telling a story. So to me, the short version is a character, a central character, protagonist, or if you like Joseph Cam- Campbell, you can use the word hero, starts out in a status quo right? They're going through, we meet them in their everyday life, the way it's been going for some time. They have what I call, and other people sometimes refer to also as a core wound, right? They have something that is unresolved in them, something that's not working for them, something that's preventing them from, you know, full actualization. But they've also evolved a set of coping mechanisms, which I call a default mode around that core wound that enables them to get through their lives with this thing unresolved, to kind of get by. But we can see as the audience that it's not totally working for them, right? And by the way, we all have these core wounds. And even if it's not the one in the story, we are relating to what this person is going through, empathizing with them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so then you have an inciting incident that disrupts the core wound or I'm sorry, that disrupts the status quo, right? And breaks up the sort of status quo that's been going on, makes it so that things can't quite continue as they have, right? Kind of turn your world upside down. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. And sets the character on a quest towards an external goal outside themselves, right? And on that quest, they encounter obstacles, challenges, They have to overcome an obstacle. The overcoming of that obstacle creates a new obstacle, right? So you have like increasing, uh, if I was drawing on a whiteboard right now, I'd be drawing that triangle, right? For a pyramid, (laughs) rising action, right? Increasing narrative tension. And by the way, the story cycle for businesses, I call that the competitors, the villains, fog, and crevasses. Those are the obstacles and antagonists they're up against. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have allies also along the way helping you solve those problems. And and all of that rising action building towards a climax where the character either reaches their goal or definitively doesn't reach their goal, right? And then there's the denouement or the take and the takeaway from that, which is what is what is the where where do we go from here, right? So, you know, in the story, even in my origin story that I told you, right, the story of the inception of the exonerated, right, at the beginning of that story, I was, you know, it's a little dramatic to call it a core wound, but like my unresolved thing was I was like, okay, I want to go to acting school, but I really feel the sense of moral responsibility and am I betraying something or being self-indulgent by making that choice? I don't know, right? And then inciting incident was the phone call from the guy in prison on the cell phone at the conference, right? Sets us on a journey. We encounter all kinds of obstacles along the way. We don't know how to do this. We've never written a play before. We don't have any money. Right? Like we run out of gas on the highway, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> right? right. Building towards rising action, building towards the climax of getting the play in front of Governor Ryan as he was considering that decision which is, you know, proving ground of like, because he, he could have watched the play and said, I don't care also, right? So that's, that was the question of like, it, are we going to actually be able to do this thing? Is it possible to actually create change with storytelling, right? The climax was that performance. The answer was yes. The denouement, the takeaway is yes, you can do that. Now let's devote the rest of our career to figuring out how to do that and how to make it repeatable. How right. You, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's when I'm teaching what I call story literacy, I get into more detail, but that's the basic frameworks that I'm talking about. So yes, there are many stages to the hero's journey. There are many systems. There's like a, a save the cat is a famous screenwriting book that oh, yeah. breaks it down into much, you know, there are lots of systems that break it down into many, many parts, but I actually think that, you know, the sort of sacred geometry, the music theory equivalent, right. For story is this, 
very basic structure. And I don't think you need all of those complex parts, right? It's great to learn about them because they're, you know, they're additional tools that you have to work with, but. And it's nuance. A lot of times you don't need that nuance. That's right. Well, because I'm working a lot of times with organizations that are like, you know, okay, this is great with all of, all of the detail and all of the nuance. I see how you can really move somebody if you have an hour, right? But what do I do if I have a one minute Instagram video? What do I do if I have three minutes, right? And so, but what's amazing is that, you know, the basic building blocks of this structure, they work in one minute, right? It's three, it's three act structure is otherwise known as beginning, middle, and an end, mm-hmm. right? Like, so it's something that you can do no matter, no matter what length of time you have, you can do a one minute Instagram video, or you can do five seasons of a television show, right? Weaving together increasingly complex iterations of this structure, right? So I like to teach it in a way that leaves room for the complexity, but gives people the basic building blocks to work with also. So that's the sort of story literacy piece. And then I also work with what I call story strategy. And that's where the implementation of these tools to create change really gets interesting. And to me, you know, I see a lot of people out there talking about, remember I said there's the way I think about it, there's two components to story, right? There's empathy and narrative tension or character and plot, right? There's a lot of people out there who are starting to talk about the plot part, right? Like they get, okay, if you're talking about how to do story, something has to happen. (laughs) <laughs> right? right? Like there have to be events, there have to be actions, there have to be obstacles to overcome, right? Like, and that is absolutely true, right? Like plot is crucial. And without plot, you don't have a story. Without narrative tension, there is no story. If something's not happening, then it's something other than a story, right? But there's not a lot of people out there, I find, talking about the first part, talking about the empathy part, talking about who are you asking your audiences to empathize with? whose journey are we going on and how do you create that emotional connection with a character who might be very different from the audience, right? And because I think that's, that's one of the things that's really exciting to me about story and its capacity to create change is that, like I said, it's a technology for triggering empathy. Our brains respond automatically. Our brains automatically empathize when, when they encounter this form, right? So what that tells me is that storytelling can be actually used as a tool to increase our empathy muscles, right? Incrementally to ask us to empathize with people who are different from us, right? Which I, mm-hmm. I think is how we create a more just and sustainable world ultimately. And then two things I think I would like to encourage our listeners to do when they hear you talk through your story literacy, you know, status quo, the core wound default mode, we get a little bit deeper into it. I think a lot of people goes, okay, well, yeah, that's great. She teaches at Juilliard's. How do I do that? But I think all they have to do is take one of their stories, something that happened to them that had a great impact in their life. And if they go back and chunk through that story, they will see that all of these elements are in that story already. I mean, they are, they are embedded in life. We just haven't been taught how to look for them. And you don't necessarily even have to know them. It's great if you can be intentional about that when you are crafting your messages so that you can take your audience on an arc. But I just ask them, look at the stories in your life that have shaped who you are, the big impact stories, even the small ones, and you're going to find these same things have happened in it. And then number two, I wanted to ask you, the, the, the second part, when you're saying, you know, empathy and narrative tension, and I had to smile when you said, you know, people just don't get the empathy part. My question is, are we just all as homo sapiens, such narcissists that we put ourselves at the center of a story and we just tell a story to tell a story versus taking the time to really understand our audience who may be employees, they may be customers, they may be shareholders, they could be vendors, they could be the community we're impacting or the social good we're trying to do and understand the story and the story framework from their point of view that would then tell us what kind of story to tell. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think, look, I think as humans, we are storytelling creatures, right? Like we exist in story. So 
we are all telling ourselves stories about ourselves constantly, right? Like that's what we do in our brains, right? Yeah. Like we just, it, you know, if like, if you look at, if you study Buddhism or any kind of mindfulness technique, like a lot of that work is about noticing that our brain's default is actually to make up stories about everything all the time and to just like pause and interrupt that for a second so we can get beyond those stories, right? Because there's a wisdom beyond them also, right? So in answer to your first question, are like, are we also, I don't, I wouldn't say that we're narcissistic for telling ourselves stories all the time about ourselves, but that is what we do, right? But not taking when, the time to understand our audiences and what story to tell them. Yes, that's right. Well, so when you're looking at using storytelling strategically, when you're looking at using storytelling to create an impact, right? To create good in the world, to create change, right? You have to start with looking at who are you talking to? Right. And the way that I train organizations to do that is about, yes, look at the demographics, right? Of course, you want to use all of the tools that are out there in marketing, you know, to segment folks and to look at like, what is your target audience and how old are they and where do they live and where, what, you know, all of the sort of, what do they care about? What do they care about? Yeah, right. What well, anti-stories what do they, are they care telling? about? Mm -hmm. That's the place where I think the work gets really interesting, right? Because, I mean, there's there's a lot of great people doing work in aspirational storytelling, right? So what are people valuing? And there's been a lot of incredible work done showing how profoundly one can create change by telling stories that are geared towards people's aspirations and towards their hopes, right? And choosing protagonists based on that. And so I, I think that's one element of it, right? But I want to look at always when I'm looking at talking to an audience, what do they care about deeply, right? What do they care about on a human level, right? So not like what are their identity politics and like who do they identify with sort of tribally, right? Because that's another tendency we have, right? We have a tendency as human beings to identify in a sort of tribal way with people who we perceive to be like us, right? And to sort of actively disidentify with people who are, we perceive to be not like us or the other, right? And one of the things I think is really exciting about story is that it actually closes that self other gap, right? It automatically makes us walk in the shoes of somebody who might otherwise be other to us and connects us to them, right? So that we include them right? Or we are included in their story, right? It, it, and I think actually on a sort of deep level, this is why storytelling is wired into us because we need to empathize in order to cooperate, in order to survive. But because we are also competitive creatures, if we don't remember to empathize with the other, we will forget that, right? If it's only competition and no cooperation, that's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. so, so I think, you know, we're dealing with a very powerful tool here, we're dealing with a tool that can get us to empathize with people who are profoundly different from us, right? So I think knowing that we can choose our protagonists strategically, knowing that the thing that's going to create that empathic connection is not like, oh, this person lives in the part of the country that I live in and they look like I look, and that, right? It's not about that. It's about this person is a parent. This person has a child that they love, right? They grew up on a street that looks like this, right? Like these, these sort of deep human things and then the sort of moral values that we care about, right? Like this person values work. They value hard work. They, whatever it is, right? Like, but they value their bonds with their family. They value giving back to the community, right? Like they value trying to get ahead and succeed in school despite all of these obstacles that they're facing, whatever. But like, I'm, you know, you look at like, what are the sort of deeper human values of the specific audience that you're trying to talk to? Right? Yeah, we, were, we were just having this conversation last night, my wife and I, when we were watching Bob Mueller and going through that and, you know, how can the far left and the far right be so completely different? And yet, they're really not so different when it comes down to they want the same things. They want safety for their family. They want opportunity. They both want health. They want justice. They just go about it in a different way. So I would imagine when you were producing The Exonerated too, you had a lot of people sitting in the crowd, arms crossed, saying, you know, prove it. Prove it to me that they deserve to not be on death row. You reminded me that Doug Passan was the person who connected us. And Doug is a defense attorney here in Arizona. I had him also on the show 
show number 182. And he was interesting in that he represented convicts, people that were convicted of a crime, but he would use storytelling and even created a little film festival out of the defense community of showing who these people are, what the, you know, the circumstances were that led to the problem, you know, that got themselves convicted and to demonstrate that they're really not as bad a people as you think and therefore was looking for lesser convictions or maybe even in some cases exoneration from it. And I think the reason why he sent me to you too is you were both dealing in that same world is how do you connect with people that may have completely opposite opinions about something, find that common ground and then bring, even if it's not a meeting of the minds, at least the minds together in a productive, nuanced way that you can talk through the issues and see both sides of it better. Well, absolutely. Because look, another tendency that our brains have is a tendency to polarize, right? Like we, our brains like to create binaries, right? Like to create opposites. Us against right? them. Us against them. Black right? against left, white. Yeah. Left against right, right? Mm-hmm. All of those. And if we are only operating in those binaries and then arguing about them, like the nature of a binary is that it stays in opposition forever, right? Like that's how it works. <laughs> yeah. So if we're, if we're like, you know, following our brains, more sort of tribalist tendencies and separating ourselves along those lines, and then just like yelling at each other across the divide from like my side and your side, we can be stuck there forever. And I think as we're seeing all around us, that's not particularly productive, right? Like it's not particularly good for society. Well, it's very productive if that's what your intent is. If you have a president that wants to divide the country, it's very powerful, but you got to understand what he and the administration may be trying to do. Right. Well, because what you get then is just more division, right? Right. And Mm -hmm. you are correct that then there are people and companies that can profit off of those divisions, right? But I also think, you know, the byproduct of that is that it creates a less sustainable society for all of us. And it leads to a breakdown in our communications and our cohesiveness as a community and as, as a, you know, as, as a society, right? So I think, you know, the reality, though, that we find over and over and over again, because Eric and I, you know, at, when we're doing this documentary work, we talk, we spend a lot of time with a lot of people who are really different from us, right, in all kinds of ways, right? The Ford Foundation sent us in 2008 to Jordan to interview Iraqi civilian refugees for a play that we wrote called Aftermath. And, you know, we spent the weeks in the Iraqi refugee communities in Amman, Jordan, working with a translator, talking to people that, you know, we're halfway around the world talking to people that our government has told us are the enemy, right? Who are so different from us culturally, ostensibly, right? And we're sitting with these Iraqi folks, all kinds of different, you know, pharmacists, clerics, scientists, artists, all kinds of different people, mothers, families. And, you know, through the language barrier, through our translator, Eric, my husband who grew up in Minnesota is sitting there saying like, these people sound like my farmer relatives in the upper Midwest. <laughs> right. Like, yep. And really like quite literally. Right. So there, so there's this whole mechanism that's trying to convince us that, Oh, these people are so different or they're scary or they're other. And like, then you sit down and actually have a human conversation about families and lives. And you start on that kind of ground and you hear that, people are just not so different. I mean, we, we were doing the interviews for Coal Country, our next play in West Virginia during right around the time of the West Virginia primary in 2016. So it was, it was an interesting experience to be down there, even though we weren't really there to talk to people about politics. Everybody was kind of talking about it because like Bernie... Bernie was actually staying in our very rural Holiday Inn while we were there. Like he was there doing a town hall. The, people were coming around. And, you know, it was pretty extraordinary. Like we were sitting with coal miners, right? And coal miners' families. And, you know, we're from New York. We're playwrights and screenwriters, right? There's all kinds of cultural messages that we're getting all the time of like, these folks are different than us. And we know that's not true. But, you know, supposedly, you know, these are hunters. They've got you know, gun racks in their living rooms and, and right. And all the cultural signifiers of like, we're from a different place than you. And then, you know, we're there in a New York 
creative people wearing black, whatever. So we've got a set of signifiers that they're supposed to think make us different from them, right? Mm -hmm. And we sit down and everybody's on the same page. Everybody wants the same thing, right? They want justice. They want to be paid for their work. They want their basic safeties to be looked after by people who are in power, right? They want meaningful work. We all actually want, you know, there used to be this sort of false split between people talking about environmental sustainability and people talking about mining jobs. And I think, you know, the days of that, at least from speaking to miners themselves, are coming to an end because they were, they're like, we know the coal is running out. Right. So our question is, what's next? Where where do our jobs come from? Where are the companies that are looking out for that? Because these are hard working people who mm-hmm. work harder than almost anybody I've seen. Right. They're like, we want to work. So what's the next step? Right. So the myth of this sort of binary polarization, left versus right, like all of that stuff is like we could get stuck there forever if we're just having political arguments. But if we start telling each other our stories, everything shifts. Yeah, there's really nothing more powerful than when you can join two separate worlds into one world through a story that they can both connect with. That's right. That's right. And that's what story does. Yeah. Well, Jessica, this has been an amazing conversation. I don't want to take you away from your trip any longer. I did want to mention your ebook, The Five Step Plan to Stop Your Inner Critic from Blocking Your Creativity. And I've been through it. It's a terrific book. And what I like about it is you don't have to be a playwright, a Juilliard trained actor or actress. You don't have to be an artist, just someone who wants to make a difference in the world in your own way by expressing your own creativity. And you've outlined these five steps that anybody can apply to say, get over yourself, get over that inner critic and just go do it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It's a set of tools. I mean, working what's, what's wonderful working both in the nonprofit advocacy worlds and in the art, the arts world and entertainment world is that I'm getting to work with people's creative, creative minds, right. With their creativity. And one of the first things, if you're doing any kind of creative work, that comes up for everybody is like, oh, I'm not going to be good enough at it, right? Like we all do that, right? The the most brilliant filmmakers, the most Pulitzer winning novelists, right? Like the, the most brilliant artists out there have that voice that comes up whenever we start to do creative work. So, you know, one of the pieces of what I do is help people with the tools to get through that. So yeah, that ebook is, it's free and it's a great little toolkit, I think, to get started with any of that work. And in that definition, creative work, the most important part of that is the work. You just have to sit down and do it. Yeah, you just got to do it. You just got to do it. Absolutely. Where can people find the book and find out more about you? Yeah, so if you go to my website, my website is www.jessicacblank.com. Don't forget the initial C in the middle. There's another Jessica Blank out there who's like a graphic designer. Ah. <laughs> and she's got jessicablank.com. So if you go, people will come to me and be like, I went to your website and it was these like cartoons. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> That's the other Jessica Blank. So jessicacblank.com. And, and they can download ebook is, your book yeah, there. You can download the ebook for free. You can also, people can email me through the website. There is some some material on the site on the work that I do around story literacy and strategy for nonprofits and advocacy organizations. There's, you know, and that my speaking around that, and then, you know, people can feel free to reach out and contact me. I do have a training that I do for nonprofits. I have a half day and a full day, and then I do private consulting. So the sort of basics of that stuff are also up on my site, along with stuff about my creative and artistic work. Uh, Terrific. Final question for you, Jessica, then I'll let you go. What would you tell your sixth grade Jessica? Hmm. What a great question. Um, keep going. You can do this, right? Like this is, this is possible. And luckily I'm, I'm very grateful to have parents that said those kinds of things to me, right. That encouraged me creatively and encouraged me to do my weird multidisciplinary hyphenate <laughs> work <laughs> and to keep going with it and to know that I could make a life out of it. You know, a lot of people don't have that, that privilege, that kind of support, like a supportive family that really supports them in following their, 
following their bliss, right? Yep. My parents As Joseph did. Campbell would say. Yeah, and my parents really did that with me when I was a young creative person. And I think it was through having that support that I was able to really find my purpose because this work around story and creating change with story, whether I'm coming at it as an artist myself or somebody who trains artists or a change maker or somebody who trains change makers, it really is my purpose. And I don't think that I would have been able to settle into that if I hadn't had a family that was encouraging. So I'm very grateful for that. Well, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. What a great conversation. I definitely want to have you back on the show at some point and talk about how specifically we could apply some of your background experience and, and your frameworks to sustainability stories about climate change and how we can have it actually have an impact in turning down the temperature a little bit on this planet. So I, I hope you'll come that. back. I would love that. That's a big one. It's really important to me. And thank you all for listening to this edition of the Business of Story. If you liked what you heard today and you feel like, you know, some Jessica's insights could really help someone in your business, maybe a colleague, maybe a friend, maybe someone out there who's trying to push change and is not having a great deal of success right now, share this episode with them, share her website with them. She has amazing experience, background and tools that you can use immediately to really make the impact you're trying to make in the world. And of course, if I can be of assistance to you in helping you with your brand story strategy, especially to really dial in that story around your purpose-driven brand, then please visit me at businessofstory.com. And until next week, when we will have another amazing story artist right here for you, just like Jessica, remember that the most potent story you will ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one. Thanks for listening.